day two of the 2020 Canadian Blind Hockey Viewing Party, presented by AMI and brought to you by the CNIB Foundation. I'm Nico Cardarelli, and with the cancellation of the 2020 Canadian National Blind Hockey Tournament due to COVID-19, we decided to bring you the next best thing with a viewing party as we all do our best to hashtag stay at home for Canada. Lots of great interaction with day one from our broadcast yesterday, and we'll get to some of the shout outs and comments later in the show. And a reminder, be sure to comment on the Viewing Party Facebook event page or on Twitter with the hashtag Blind Hockey at Home. For today's show, I am again joined by Canadian Blind Hockey Program Manager Luca DeMontis and Executive Director Matt Morrow. Plus, we've got a couple of special guests as joining us first is Toronto Ice Owls player Amanda Proven, followed later in the show by Canadian National Team Captain Kelly Serbu. Well, today's double header features the youth division and the open division, but before we get to our preview show, let's start off with Matt and Luca and some comments on yesterday's game. Luca, what did you think of that youth game yesterday? I thought it was amazing to watch. You know, uh, we were lucky to meet you, Nico, and I to be on the broadcast live, right? So we got to see all that as it happened. But, you know, as I rewatch game tape and I rewatch footage like that, it truly does bring a smile to my face. You know what I mean? We had, I think, like we mentioned, our youngest was three years old, right? Three years old on the ice. And it's so easy to say that the future is so bright and there's so much talent out there, but it's the truth. And that's why we say it, right? Like I get a joy of watching someone like Mason, right? When that puck is on his stick and to see him celebrate after every goal, it's, it's easy to fall in love, not only with the sport of blind hockey, but to fall in love with the people that are taking part in this sport, right? He comes from a great family. He's an incredible individual who really keeps us on our toes every Sunday morning at our GTA youth program, right? So I thought the children's game was incredible. Um, I know everybody tuning in, I bet they had a blast watching it. And yeah, those are future all-stars, future national team members of the Canadian and the American teams, right? So I feel it's a great way to start this viewing party with the future. And I think, Personally, I had a blast watching it, and it's it's a, just a testament, Nico, to the sport. And Matt, what did you think of yesterday's low vision and development division game? You know, a uh, lot stood out for me. Um, that's one of my favorite divisions because, you know, when you see the elite players that uh, are on the Canadian national team, um, there's not a ton of modifications between traditional hockey and uh, blind hockey because – in most cases, they grew up playing hockey. They had that opportunity. And when you look at the low vision development division, that is where we've truly made the sport of hockey accessible by making it four on four, uh, by removing the pass rule. Uh, when you watch that game, I mean, to see Ed out there as our veteran at 83 years old, that's just impressive for hockey, period. Whether it's blind hockey or traditional hockey or any type of hockey, that just shows it's a sport for life and that's something we can all aspire to. A couple of my personal favorites. I mean, there's lots of great players out there. Uh, you know, to see Randy Cameron out there, uh, a B1 player who plays center, uh, scores goals. Uh, you know, he's still got that wicked wrist shot. Uh, sometimes he'll fire it right into the corner because he's disoriented himself. But, you know, just working with him over the years, seeing the way that he is so spatially aware and he trains for it. He counts his strides on the ice. So any new rink that you go to with him, he'll line up at center. He'll take a few strides and he'll ask you and say, hey, am I on the blue line? And if he's at a traditional NHL rink, he's almost always exactly on the blue line. And a lot of times with recreational facilities, they're not quite 200 by 85. So if he's off by a few feet, once you provide him that feedback for the rest of the game, he's going to know where he is, which is, you know, really inspirational. And then another one I'll shout out is uh, John T. John T., you know, fell in love with the sport of blind hockey. I don't even know how many years ago. Could barely skate. Uh, he works harder at teaching himself than, than so many players. For those of you that, you know, follow blind hockey on Facebook, you'll see that his, uh, his method of self-isolating has been to practice stick handling for an hour each day. So uh, to see him progress and to see how he played out there. Uh, but again, congratulations to all the players. That was a fantastic viewing experience. Yeah, I think you guys both hit on it there. Just some fantastic 
people involved at all levels of the sport and a great job showcasing some of those players uh, from our games yesterday. Well, speaking of fantastic people involved with blind hockey, we better bring in our special guest. So let's turn our attention to Amanda Proven. Amanda, you discovered blind hockey three years ago at the 2017 Canadian Nationals Try It session. And incredibly, you've been to basically every blind hockey event since. I haven't even been to as many events as you have. You've recently penned a pretty powerful testimonial as well about your experiences with the sport. So I want to ask you, what do you love about blind hockey? Well, uh, first of all, the community is incredible. I've met so many amazing people uh, across Canada and the United States. Um, also, just being able to play hockey with people who are also visually impaired is, is incredible to me because I, I grew up playing sighted hockey, being the last on the puck and, the, you know, not seeing that shot, not seeing the, the pass. So being able to receive a pass and to, to be a, a big part of the game is, is, is incredible to me. I just love it. I know you're a extremely driven person and you've got some personal goals within the sport. Can you tell us about what some of your goals are in blind hockey? Um, I aspire to be the first woman to make the Canadian national team. Um, I've been training really hard and uh, try to go to every blind hockey event, as you, as you mentioned, just to get as much ice time as possible. Um, and I also still play sighted hockey in a women's league, so that's good too. And it's all hopefully propelling me towards my goal. Yeah, you're certainly on the ice as much as you can be, really dedicated, and uh, you're a great role model for a lot of the young girls. Can you maybe talk about some of the youngsters that you've formed a friendship with that maybe look up to you as a role model within the sport? Well, I like to volunteer at the uh, GTA youth program whenever I can. And I've met uh, many players, um, but I've spent a particular amount of time with Chinsia, who is one of the female players. She's a B1, and she's, she's incredible. She's skating so fast. She's so confident on the ice. Um, she, she refers to me as her favorite blind hockey player, which I think is incredible. Um, but, yeah, it's just, it's just so great. So Chinsia is certainly a special player, but last year at the 2019 Nationals, it was a banner year for women in the sport. It was the first time we had women and girls playing in all five divisions at the national tournament. As a female player in the game, what does that mean to you to, to witness that growth and be a part of that growth? I think it's, it's incredible. Um, women in hockey, are, it's growing in general with the uh, PWHPA movement and all, all they've been doing. So to see, to see the same thing happening in blind hockey is, is, is really incredible. Um, it, it gives me hope that we'll have a, a team soon. And uh, we, we are having a, a, a training camp at some point later this year, which I'm really looking forward to, to meet all the different women players from across, I guess, the world. Yeah. And, and I want to ask you more about that in just, just a second. But um, before we get to that, I want to know how blind hockey has changed your life. You've been in the sport for three years. You've been so active. How has your life just been different since 2017? Um, firstly, I, it's opened the doors to all sorts of different para sports for me. I've been trying as many as I can. I like to row. I like, I've played some goal balls and beat baseball. So just, just being able to be more involved in, in the community is fantastic. And, um, it's given me a lot of confidence and I, I've been able to overcome a lot of things because of blind hockey and the difference it has made in my life. Um, I suffer from um, pretty bad anxiety and this has given me the chance to kind of shift out of my comfort zone to um, do things I'm not comfortable with and to, to meet new people and to start conversations, to make friends. And it's also helped a lot with, uh, elevating my mood I, I look forward to all the hockey events I look forward to seeing all the people just just stuff like that it's just it's changes every aspect of your life pretty powerful stuff the way sport can impact anyone's life and I know for me I took a lot of time off of hockey probably a, a good 10 years between um, when I stopped playing and got back into it and for me one of the best things about getting back into it was just 
the joy of being on the ice, right? Your mind just kind of goes free. You don't worry about all the outside stresses and problems that you have. You're just playing the game. So for you, what's the best part of just being on the ice? I just find in general, it's just an escape from everything going on in the world around me. Yeah. It's somewhere where it's, it's decently predictable as to what's going to happen. There's going to be a winner. There's going to be a loser. There's going to be goals scored. Um, it's, it's just a overall great experience. I just love hockey in general. All right. So you mentioned it, and I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about it. The women's development camp that was in the works, and we'll get Matt to touch on this a little bit too, but Amanda, how excited for, how excited for that camp were you, and how, um, what does it mean to you to see that camp, there, there being a tangible plan in place to hold the first ever women's blind hockey development camp? Well, for me, it's more ice time, which is fantastic. Also just getting to meet all the people and uh, growing the sport for women in general is fantastic. To, to be able to potentially have a women's national team someday is, is something I really look forward to. And I'm, I'm excited to, to start the foundation for that and to get on the ice with all the amazing blind hockey players. So Matt, let's follow up with you on the topic of women's blind hockey. I wanna ask you about the program how did it come to be, and what's the plan? Well, I think you said it best, actually, on the games we watched last night when you were speaking with Luca and you referred to it, that at the 2019 Canadian Nationals, there were girls and women in all five divisions. So children, youth, low vision development, open, and select, which, you know, just shows what a significant portion of the community are women's blind hockey players. And following that this year at the summer camp, uh, the summer development camp, we had 25% of the players were female. Uh, and I was coaching that camp and, and obviously spent a week interacting with them on and off the ice and, and chatting with, you know, our players about their aspirations and the landscape. Uh, and we also like to, you know, we're, we're a part of the Canadian sports system. So we like to look at role models in, in other organizations. Uh, Amanda referenced the larger movement to grow women's uh, hockey in general. And also we've had a partnership to a degree uh, with the Canadian women's sled team um, through, through Janice, their president who helped us with one of our, our Edmonton area events. So um, to see that, you know, technically sled hockey was co-ed for so many years, but no women's sled player was ever able to make that national team. Um, you know, the, the same reason that there's men's hockey and there's women's hockey that they felt the need to develop the women's side of the game. And we thought, you know what, we should get on that immediately. So, um, that's kind of where we got the idea that, that this was something we should be focusing on. So, and Matt, referring to Janice Coulter there, of course, the president of the women's sledge hockey, uh, the national team for Canada doing a great job there. But Matt, what's, um, what's the plan with blind hockey and growing the women's side of the sport at the moment? Yeah. So, uh, as Amanda mentioned, it's the camp that we announced. So, uh, there's this fantastic grant called the Daryl K. Seaman Canadian Hockey Fund, and it's administered by the Calgary Foundation. And if you've never heard of Daryl K. Seaman and you have some time, uh, definitely worth checking out the Wikipedia. You know, survived World War II, shot down a couple times, uh, helped bring the flames to Calgary, and then left an endowment fund that helps grow the sport of hockey all across the country. It's a pretty cool legacy. Wow. Um, and that fund has actually been integral in growing blind hockey in general. So we received grants from that fund to start our first ever youth camp in 2014. Uh, we received funds to expand that youth camp to all ages in 2015, which is now the annual summer development camp. And then we received funds in 2016 to start Eastern and Western regional blind hockey events. So everything that this fund has supported has turned out to be a cornerstone program of Canadian blind hockey. So after speaking with Amanda, after speaking with Hillary, um, you know, the girls out of Nova Scotia, uh, just about putting together uh, what we were gonna do for the women, it seemed very obvious to me that we'd talk to the Calgary Foundation and they awarded us a grant to get this camp off the ground. So we were just about to put out a survey monkey to try to figure out when worked best to sneak it into a jam-packed blind hockey calendar. And unfortunately due to the, the shutdown with COVID-19, we're going to have to leave it TBD at the moment, but at some point we will have a camp. You know, we've done our research. We know we've got approximately 
uh, 20 women blind hockey players across the country that are teenagers or older. So that's not even counting the kids in the program um, that would be able to come. And then, of course, once we've taken care of getting as many Canadians as possible, we'll open that registration up internationally. Uh, tons of women blind hockey players in the U.S. You know, the, the recent camp in Finland, there was uh, probably at least 25% uh, women player there as well. So uh, I really think there's a bright future for that sport. And I think by jumping on it early, uh, we'll be able to grow it rather quickly in parallel to, to the mixed program and the, the men's program uh, once they become separate. Well, that's incredibly exciting. Well, let's bring Luca into this. Luca, you've been the program manager for all three seasons of the Canadian Blind Hockey GTA Youth Program, and there's been quite a few young girls participating. I know they even had some special events with women's hockey. So what does that progress mean to those young girls? Well, first off, I want to thank Amanda for coming out and helping us out there on Sundays. You know, Chinsia is an individual that – is incredible. You know, when we first got Chinsia three years ago, the first time she put on skates was with us in the change room. But her energy was through the roof. She was probably the most excited to get out there. And you know what? She really didn't do much skating, but she had more fun than everybody else. And her smile is contagious. Her laugh brightens our room. You know, so she's definitely someone that a program like this will help out. And Amanda's been there helping her along the way. And you know what? It's crazy because you actually see the improvement in three years, right? She's skating now. She's skating backwards. And she's challenging coaches to races, right? So it's cool to see. And it's incredible to see the growth. But yeah, you're right. We've, we've been able to partner with some incredible women's organizations. You know, uh, the Markham Thunder. Um, they were great. Uh, Chelsea Purcell, she's been an incredible advocate for women's hockey. She's been incredibly to work with uh, for myself. So we had a bunch of our girls head on over to watch a Markham Thunder game about a year ago. And also Amanda and a couple of the other girls, they got to go out and they got to watch um, one of the PWHPA games, right, that took place in Toronto. So this is just us working together with like-minded individuals to provide a positive outlook for our children and youth and also women to play or talk to their role models, other women that are playing the game they love. So I know Amanda got to meet some other women that play the game, you know, um, I'm sure she'll be able to touch base on that, but it's really just important for us to provide these girls, these women, the opportunity to play this game of blind hockey. You know, um, it's, it's crazy to say it, but this hockey is for everyone. You know what I mean? The NHL is proving it. Everybody is saying it. We're just going to prove it. You know, we've got women from across this country that play this game, right? Um, I'd be reminisced if I didn't mention someone like Mary Ellen McKechn, who's the captain of the Nova Scotia Sea Kings, right? So it's, uh, it's cool to see that these girls love this game um, and they're part of it. And let me tell you, it's hard to take the puck off them because I've had the privilege to play with some of them and uh, they're, they're out there and they love it as much as anybody else. So I'm sure Amanda could touch base on just what it was like for you to meet some of your role models that you got to talk with and share your goals with them during the PWPH game. Yeah, Amanda, feel free to comment on that for sure. Um, I spent the afternoon at the rink. We saw three or four games. And I also met uh, Rebecca Johnston and Brianna Decker and got a picture with them. Uh, that was pretty cool. And they also, they had some autograph signings um, after the game. So I got a bunch of autographs and talked to them and um, shared my dream of being the first female player to play on the Canadian blind national team. And uh, some of them were, were pretty, they were very, all very supportive and some of them were pretty, pretty impressed. And so the, um, one of them even said that nobody else was going to beat that dream or something mm -hmm. like that. And I just, I just thought that was incredible, incredible. And it was, it was, it was an am amazing experience all in all. Well, that's really cool. That's, uh, that's an incredible case of, you know, athletes supporting each other. As someone who's been so close to the CWHL, the women's game for many years, it's really exciting uh, to witness this growth in terms of women's blind hockey. And, and a player like you, Amanda, can pursue your dream and hopefully one day don that national team jersey. Well, I want to thank you, Amanda, for joining us. This was a really great segment. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll come back with Canadian National Blind Hockey Team Captain Kelly Serbu before we tee up today's doubleheader. Hey, everyone. 
everybody. Welcome back to the 2020 Canadian Blind Hockey Viewing Party presented by AMI and brought to you by CNIB Foundation. Well, after our short break, we're very pleased now to be joined by Canadian National Blind Hockey Team Captain Kelly Serbu. Kelly, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. So this was a really great season, and it was the second season for the Canadian National Blind Hockey Team program. Kelly, tell us a little bit more about the 2019-2020 season. Well, first of all, it was too short. Um, but other than that, I can say that it started the summer camp in August, and it was amazing. Uh, we had, uh, you know, almost a full week of uh, ice time, off-ice training, time to build and bond, uh, ability to, to make and, I guess, make our friendships even better than they were before we started camp. Everyone got to know everyone a lot better. Um, the camp was, uh, I would say, uh, probably, in my view, at least 50, if not 80 percent better than the first camp we had. Uh, I found it was uh, really intense throughout the entire camp from, from start to finish. Everyone was there to prove themselves. And, and this was the first time that, you know, we actually, there was tryouts for it. Because when we had our first camp, uh, the team had already been selected in March at the end of the 2019 uh, National Championships in, in Toronto. So this, this camp was a true camp. The people came there. There was fitness testing. If they had to perform, if they didn't perform, unfortunately, some guys didn't, didn't make the team and, and more part of what we did. So obviously that camp was leading up to a big event and that of course was the International Blind Hockey Series against Team USA and that was held in Ottawa this past November. That was obviously another historic event, the first time the International Series was held on Canadian ice. But for you, it had extra special meaning because it took place in Ottawa. Tell us a little bit about how that event went and how special it was for you to play on home ice in a sense. Well, first of all, playing Canada against the United States, you know, the second ever world, I guess, championships, uh, best on best. It was, it was great just, first of all, to be on Canadian soil. To be in Ottawa, where I've been living for the past three years now, uh, was extra special. I, I knew the rate. Uh, OSEG was the big promoter of the event, and the Ottawa 67s were so supportive. To be able to go to their barn and to play in that historic venue with their support uh, just made it, you know, tenfold uh, better. Uh, it was it was it was exciting. Uh, leading up to it, there was uh, you know a lot of chatter on the internet, social media. Uh, Luke and Matt did a great job uh, promoting. So did the Americans. Um, so just being able to to step on the ice in our nation's capital. Uh, with our first ever, I guess, best on best in Canada was, was amazing, you know. Uh, and for me, it was great because, you know, it allowed me, it was close enough that my, my father and my kids could come up to watch it. Uh, extra special, my daughter sang the national anthem uh, during uh, the first game. And then um, by popular demand, she came back and sang it at the last game as well. Uh, and when he, when he says by popular demand... I must have had pretty much every single blind hockey player at the event come up to me and say, hey, Matt, I heard she's not singing on Sunday. What's going on? We, we, we want her to sing. It wasn't my choice at that point. The people had spoken, and it was, please, Maya, will, will you sing it again for us? She did such an awesome job. So, so for me, it was really cool because my kids got to see me play in, in our nation's capital. Uh, so that was, that was pretty neat. Uh, she's pretty uh, disappointed that uh, the tournament was canceled. Today's actually her 17th birthday, and she was going to sing the national anthem today at uh, the Madison Center. So unfortunately, we'll have to wait till she's uh, she's 18. Happy birthday, Maya! Luca just beat me to the punch. We'll at the very least give her a happy birthday shout out. Happy birthday, Maya! You know, you, Kelly, you talk about your family, your kids, your parents. I actually want to touch on your actual family before we get to your hockey family. Um, and I think one of the maybe favorite stories I've heard over the years is when you told me that your dad still calls you up and critiques you after your games. Can you talk about the relationship that you have with your dad? Oh, me and my dad, I mean, we're, we're back and forth teasing each other all the time. But, you know, it's a really – good relationship like he's been there for me obviously since day one but yeah he's been there in so many different ways like i couldn't if i had to make a list of the number of things that my father has helped me with throughout my life i'd run out of paper um from so school, what a line. Your, your simple decisions to professional choices to make just overall you know just 
things that pop up for the moment. I talk, I talk to my dad every day, right? Yeah. So, but yeah, so so jokingly, yeah, he does critique me. Uh, just the other day, he sent me a video with the, the, the best five uh, exercises to do at home in the locker room to, to improve your skating. I don't know if he's trying to sell me something or not. But, <laughs> but yeah, so. Uh, it's pretty awesome. Uh, you know, I do want to now expand on your hockey family, and obviously it's a, it's a pretty big group, but I think there's a really special tight-knit bond within that national team program, that group of guys. Can you expand on that special connection you guys have? Um, I, guess it, I guess the family really started, I guess, for me, when I started playing white hockey, for me, this would have been my fifth year actually playing blind hockey and if we would have went ahead with the, the tournament starting today my first tournament was in 2016 so prior to i guess stepping into the madden center i actually never hung out or knew any other blind visually impaired athletes mm. so for me the moment family began on that day when i walked into the rink and met the first you know visually impaired hockey players that i've been end up playing with uh, and it's just, you know, it's a community. So every time you go back at an event, those relationships grow stronger and stronger and stronger. And then, you know, it just it exploded when we announced the national team uh, for the 2019-2018-2019 season. Uh, so, you know, we got to know the players even more when we were close to a week at the, uh, the Florida Center in Vernon, BBC. Uh, and it just grows from there. I mean, every time we have the opportunity to, to get together, some one-on-one -on -one time with players, you know, and we range, I think the youngest kid might be player on our team is 16 and then we're into our 60s. So there's a very wide breadth of, of life experiences. Um, so it's pretty neat to get together and you get to learn more about, you know, each player's individual sort of, uh, you know, quirks and likes and dislikes and that. Um, so that was, you know, one thing that I miss about going back to the tournament this year was that you don't get that extra time to bond with people. Um, but we have a group chat, and everyone's live on it back and forth. But today, happy birthday, Tristan. Tristan shares a birthday with my daughter. Uh, so we're constantly getting updates, and you know, guys are sending out you know, best wishes to everyone in this COVID-19 sort of uh, crisis and the lockdown. Um, but yeah, so the family's continuing to grow, and we added a couple of new players to our family uh, at camp, with Tristan and with Thomas. Uh, and I think that you know, players that may not have made the team this year but have been with our team in the past they're still part of that family they, they never leave that family or, or or that fold right they may not be with us for a season but they're still in our thoughts and our you know our best wishes obviously well you know i knew you were fast on the ice you're really fast because you're jumping ahead in our program we're going to save the birthday wishes till our final show and yeah the minister of defense tristan Lindbergh, celebrating a birthday there's a couple more shout outs we'll get later on as well uh, because of a number of players celebrating birthdays over this weekend. Um, one of the things I do want to ask you, and I think it's pretty impressive, not only are you busy in your professional life and your family life, and you excel in a lot of areas on the ice and off the ice, but one of the things that you seem to make a real effort um, to participate in is the learn to skate and try it programs and kind of helping that next generation of players. Why is it so important to you to be involved at the youth level of blind hockey? I mean, I started, I guess, skating. My parents put me on the ice when I was three. So I wasn't diagnosed with my visual impairment until I was 19. So I had 16 years of playing hockey without anyone, you know, thinking maybe some of them thought I had a visual impairment when they watched me move the hot ground days at times. But anyway, um, I really, I had the opportunity to put my kids into hockey and watch my kids skate and to, you know, develop and then eventually, you know, they, they moved on to other interests. But for me, I really like watching the kids, but it's it's the parents that sort of give me the, you know, the, that's nice, right? Because a lot of the parents, unfortunately, you know, I don't know if they, some of them may have the view that maybe their child cannot do something because they have a visual impairment. And then seeing their child on the ice skating for the first time with other kids with, you know, the same type of uh, you know, vision issues, right? Um, you see them beam and they're like, oh my God, my, my kid is doing what all their friends do now, right? So I love to see it from a parent's point of view and to see, watch those parents beam and, and the parents enjoy it 
as much if not more than the kids on the ice, right? Um, so it's twofold. I want those kids to have that experience of being part of the team, right? And I love seeing the parents watch their kids, I guess, enjoy that and, and be part of that team. And, and they actually have the same, it's, it's the same for the parents I see as it's for the kids. That the parents are there talking to the parents like they normally do in every hockey rink. Uh, so they get the same experience. It can be the hockey mom and the hockey dad. We're speaking with the Canadian National Blind Hockey Team captain, Kelly Serbu. And before we get Luca and Matt back involved in the chat, Kelly, just to wrap up this little interview, as the captain of the national team, where do you personally hope the future of blind hockey goes? Well, once we uh, get out of uh, this COVID-19 uh, craziness, um, we had the best season uh, this last year in blind hockey. So program-wise, and I'm sure financially-wise, with the amount of money that we raised through individual and corporate sponsors, and we're going up in blind hockey from what I see, and I'm not a very good seer, but I think I'm right on this, is we're going off the charts. We're going straight up, right? And we have to continue to go in that direction, and we can't take the, our foot off the pedal here. Uh, I was fortunate enough to go over to uh, Finland with, uh, with Matt and with Luca. Uh, and Francois Beauregard uh, at the end of January to help the Finns and to watch the Finns and participate in their first ever blind hockey summer and, you know, try hockey. And, and it was amazing. So where I see the sport going is, you know, globally uh, and, you know, just expanding. So there's Sweden wants to get involved. We hear about the UK and Russia. I think that between Matt and Luke and the leadership of the offer the program, we have to continue pedal to the metal and just keep rolling out those programs, getting the social awareness out there. And we have to be ready when we come out of this, you know, this social distancing is gonna last for a little bit longer, I think. And I think that when this is over, we have to be ready to offer these programs back to, you know, all our youth, our adults, the national team, everyone who wants to play blind hockey, they're gonna to wanna to get back at it. And we have to be prepared to offer that to them. Spoken like a true leader, very well said. So Luca, of course, the program manager for Canadian Blind Hockey, but also the general manager of the, the Canadian National Blind Hockey team. And Luca, I'd like if you could expand a little bit on how the program has grown over the first two years and where your hopes for the future of this national team program are. For sure, Nico, definitely. Uh, over the two years, the program's grown. You know what I mean? Uh, a big testament to the program is the coaching staff and leadership, right? as Kelly has alluded to that that group is like a family and families always look out for each other and stick up for one another. And that's what that group has done. Um, we've had a couple new additions to the team this year. Um, with that being said, they just, they just jumped right into place and like they never skipped a beat, right? We've got some very talented individuals on this team, some great ambassadors for the sport. But at the end of the day, I think the one thing where we continue to grow is we continue to evolve. As Kelly mentioned, our first training camp, we just invited a team. Our second training camp, we actually made it a training camp with tryouts where guys knew not, nothing was given. You had to get it earned, right? And I think that brings a lot to the table because now you're bringing the best, the best out of every player possible, right? So we continue to evolve. Um, been meeting with the coaching staff, myself and Paul Karens. We constantly meet just for ideas, how to keep these guys in shape in the off season, right? For example, we've been having calls this week about how are we going to deal with not seeing these players at an event like this where we feed them so much information about their game on the ice, right? Little things they could learn. Um, and it's difficult when you're staying inside, right? What are some workouts you could do in your living room, right? And so forth. So we're constantly growing, we're evolving, but I like to think the sport is in the right direction. Um, we've got the goal of being leaders for the sport in the world, right? We want to set the precedence and have everyone else follow us, right? And that's one of the things that we hold very with the utmost respect and pride to ourselves, right? So I think we're going in the right direction. I think we're going to keep going. As Kelly mentioned, we're going to keep pushing up. Uh, we're going to keep growing. Uh, we're going to keep getting better, but every other country that's learning, they're going to also get better. So it's good to see that the sport's growing and we're just looking for other countries to continue to help grow the sport with so we can one day play against them. 
Uh, it's very exciting stuff. And tomorrow we'll expand more on the international growth of blind hockey. But in the meantime, we have to acknowledge some of the incredible support and response that we've uh, received so far from the community. And we want to thank everyone for being a part of our 2020 viewing party. Let's check out some of the comments we've been getting on Facebook. First, starting off with Nathan Tunis of Le Bou de Montreal, and of course, a co-winner with Brandon Joy for the Most Improved Player Award at the 2019 Canadian Nationals. Nathan says, man, I need to say that being forced not to play blind hockey is tough. Not being able to play in the biggest and most fun event of the whole year is really tough. But we need to stay strong as a community in this crisis. Thank you to all the coaches and volunteers who helped me become the player I am today. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you guys. Thank you. And I especially want to thank my hockey team, Le Bou, for an amazing season. And I'm really excited to be back on the ice with you all as soon as we can. And lastly, thank you to the blind hockey community and blind hockey for all the amazing memories that we have for the rest of our life. Really well said, Nathan. Really I also good. want to, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just saying, that was incredible, Nathan. We feel your pain, Nathan. This is the one weekend a year where we're in charge of Maple Leaf Gardens, and we don't get that chance this year. So we'll see you at the next one. So, so. Ian Rankin chimes in also on Facebook. And again, you can have your comments posted through the event viewing page. As Ian says, this is the next best thing to playing the game, which I'm hoping we can all get back to playing soon. Wishing everyone all the best. Stay safe and healthy. Guys, we've also been getting some incredible comments on Twitter and pictures as well, including one from Amanda's mom, Lisette, who's a, a huge blind hockey supporter and was one of the first Twitter users to use the hashtag blind hockey at home. When she posted that her and Amanda were patiently waiting for the show as she posted a picture of Amanda shooting the blind hockey putt into a net on their driveway. Really great stuff. But so far, I think our best social media post has to go to Lisa Marie Guest as she posted a video of her son and future blind hockey superstar Caden watching the broadcast party when Luca mentioned that he had been planning a pizza party. His face just lit up at that moment, and it's a great video that's posted on the Canadian Blind Hockey Facebook page. And again, we want to thank everyone for all their comments. You can get involved using the hashtag blind hockey at home on Twitter and through the Facebook event page. All right. So Matt, you and Luca were interacting with the community during day one of the watch party. What did you see? And what is this new initiative that you two guys have cooked up? Thanks Nico. Yeah. So, I mean, day one of the watch party was a lot of fun. Uh, Normally, I'm so busy at the events that I don't actually get to catch a lot of the games. And a lot of the times, I forget to go back and watch the archives. So it's been really neat as we prepared these videos uh, to watch the games and watch it again with the community. We saw many of our regulars, uh, you know, players, parents of players, fans commenting on there. Uh, but then Luke and I both started getting lots of texts, pictures of people enjoying the broadcast. So we put our heads together real quick. And we've decided to launch a competition. So the contest is going to be the Blind Hockey at Home Sweepstakes. All you need to do is take a picture today, Saturday, March 28th, and send it to either Luca or I via email or Facebook by midnight. We're going to pick the best 10 pictures of you practicing blind hockey at home or enjoying blind hockey at home. We'll post a photo gallery tomorrow morning. And by the end of tomorrow's blind hockey broadcast, we will select the winner based on which of the 10 pictures has the most likes. We'll get a look at some of the pictures we've al uh, already gotten. Here's one from Francois Beauregard enjoying the action. And, and here we get a look at Jill Stewart watching in Halifax. Uh, she's enjoying the viewing party. And there's a look at her setup. So a really exciting contest. And we encourage everyone to get involved. Kelly, how are you going to celebrate blind hockey at home? I can't tell you it's a secret. You have to wait. 
<laughs> you can't even tease us a little bit. <laughs> no, how are you going to celebrate it? I think I got my jersey here. I mean, come on. I think that's pretty good. Hey, hey, I'll start with my AMI water bottle. All right. Okay. <laughs> We're thirsty for more. Let's put it that way. <laughs> All right, so I think now's a good time to tee up tonight's doubleheader. First, we have the youth division final between the Thunder and the Furies. Matt, you were on the ice with the youth group. What can we expect from this game? Yeah, thanks, Nico. Uh, I actually made a few notes here about this game. You know, looking back, it's been a full year, and you, you kind of forget about some of the milestones we've hit. Um, I truly believe the youth division at last year's 2019 National Blind Hockey Tournament to be one of the coolest things we have ever done in Canadian blind hockey. Um, it is the only time in the history of the sport that there's ever been a full blind hockey game played at only the youth level. So uh, our youngest participant was nine years old. Our oldest participant was early 20s, which you know, for, for able-bodied sport, people would go, how is that possible, right? You know, two-year age gaps at most. But in, in sports for athletes with a disability, that's, that's not that uncommon, right? And so we've got lots of um, coaches, experienced volunteers, and we were able to do a balancing game on Friday and identify which kids had the size and skill and necessary experience uh, to play in the appropriate level. One of the neatest things about this is we had some kids come who had come from skill development programs. So they'd come from the GTA youth program. They'd come from the W. Ross McDonald blind hockey program. They had never played a game before. So on Friday, when we had the first game, the reason I didn't have GTHL refs out there and, and I was out there was effectively I was half referee, half coach. In, in fact, I'd say on Friday night, I was more coach than referee. We had players that didn't know where to line up for face-offs. We had players that had no idea the concept of offsides. I had to constantly blow offsides. We had crease violations. They didn't know the pass rules. It was really an experiment to see how it would go. Um, I had fantastic volunteers on both benches that were there to teach uh, the players. And so it would stop the play every time there was something wrong. And, uh, you know, if we did too many offsides in a row, we'd just bring the kids together and would explain what the offsides were and ensure that there was coaching being done. The really cool thing is the game you're about to watch is the Sunday morning final. And from Friday to Sunday, this division evolved more than anything I've ever seen in blind hockey. And it's a full blind hockey game. I am not coaching in any way, shape, or form out there. I am simply refereeing the game. And by the way, Nico, you're awfully cruel about my refereeing. Uh, <laughs> it the way through the game. I was doing the best that I could. All right. You know, I'm sorry to interrupt. I don't like to rag on referees, but I got to think if I made a comment, it was probably deserving. That Nico, said, I, I do apologize if I was cruel. Nico, he said that he's only half referee. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. So uh, I was refereeing the game. I wasn't having to coach the kids. They played a fantastic game. Um, one of the neatest things about it, you know, both boys and girls, we had players from five different Canadian programs. So we had kids from the Newfoundland Islanders, the Nova Scotia Sea Kings, the CBH GTA Youth Program, CBH W. Ross McDonald Program, uh, the Calgary Sea and Ice Dogs. And then about a third of our players were actually Americans, mostly coming from the Pittsburgh Program uh, and then the new Dallas Blind Hockey Program. So what you're going to see in this game, not only is it a very entertaining blind hockey game, but this really is the immediate future of the sport. These are the kids that are going to be progressing from the youth to the adult development and then adult open divisions, uh, and many of which aspire to someday be on that Canadian national team. So um, I think that, you know, this is one of the best games that you're going to watch all weekend and enjoy. Uh, that's exciting stuff, but we better move on before I say something that upsets you. I'm already in enough hot water. So let's let's get involved with Luca here and talk about the open division game, which we're going to watch between the Leafs and the St. Pats. Luca, tee that one up for us. For sure. Well, you know what? The open division is actually truly our first original division. Back when this tournament started in 2013, we really only had one division. At that point in time, we had 45 blind hockey players. 
they were pretty much really only 45 blind hockey players from across the world at that time. And they all came to Toronto to take part in the first ever Canadian National Blind Hockey Tournament. So to see how far we've evolved from 2013 to 2019, where we had five separate divisions from children's, youth, low vision development, open, and select, it's, it's a true symbolic feature that the game's growing literally across the stage, across Canada and across the world, right? A couple other little cool little facts about this game. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. Everybody wants to see scoring. There's a lot of scoring. There's some big saves that take place. So it's going to be exciting to watch. I've been looking forward to it. I've actually watched it a couple times now leading up to this. Another little cool fact is between Canada and America, we had members from eight different teams. USA blind hockey is truly growing, right, with the amount of programs they got in the country. And that's a big testament to, you know, players playing the game and more players out there playing. Um, aside from that, I think this was truly an exciting game. There's a, there's a gold medal on the line. As like I said, it's a competitive sport. There's some competitive juices flowing in this game. And a little uh, side note, which is pretty cool, that when the broadcast is done, the game is over, stick around because we're going to have CEO from AMI, David Arrington, and a legend when it comes to Maple Leaf Gardens and the Toronto Maple Leafs, Doug Gilmore, on hand to hand out the gold medals and the silver medals to both teams. So that's a cool little treat that you're allowed to stick around and watch. Yeah, absolutely exciting stuff. You know, before we wrap things up, you mentioned that we were so lucky to have Doug Gilmore and Leafs legends at the tournament last year. Well, Kelly was involved with a bit of a Leaf legend last year as well in one of the opening puck drops when Wendell Clark dropped the puck. Kelly, before we wrap things up, can you just talk about how cool that was to be on the ice at Maple Leaf Gardens and have one of the most iconic Leafs of all time dropping the puck to you in that ceremony. Oh, that was awesome. I mean, he was, he was out there. I remember watching him, you know, with his, with his shot and his knuckles. He was ferocious on the ice. He was a beast, right? Uh, he kept in really good shape. It was great for him to come out to support us. And he was kind enough and came into the dressing room and talked to uh, our team before going on the ice. It was, it was awesome to have the support of not only Wendell, but uh, Dougie and, and all the other people that came out uh, as, I guess, honorary, you know, puck droppers and uh, supporters. Well, guys, I want to thank all of you so much for your time. This has been a really exciting chat, and I appreciate the chance for all of us to get together here virtually as this has been day two of the Canadian Blind Hockey Viewing Party presented by AMI and brought to you by CNIB Foundation. <laughs>